<sighs> Here we go. Okay. Um, well, and now we need to thank both Shambhala Publications and Sadra Foundation for making me do this. And <laughs> And I'm actually delighted to do something with Larry. We've never done this. We've done other things, but we haven't done this. And I've known Larry from a Tibetan class in 1974, uh, and we've been friends ever since then. That's kind of amazing. Um, and um, so this is fun, actually, to do with Larry. Um, I uh, did prepare something. We have, I think if you saw, on, we had like kind of three issues, three levels of issues, and so um, they were something about literalism versus um, creative translation, and then group translation versus, you know, sort of isolated single translation, and then about the target audience, restricted or scholarly translations. I'm going to address something in the first one. I actually have a little spiel about that. Maybe you could say even a, a bee in my bonnet. And, um, and that's all I prepared, and then the rest will be in conversation. Um, and, it's, and it's this, um, well, first, it's this issue of literalism, because y I, we just keep thinking that's done and solved and resolved, and everybody knows there's no such thing as a literal translation, and it just keeps coming up again and again. Uh, and so I'm going to like put it away forever now, <laughs> except I just read about a guy, I have a note on him somewhere in here, I forgot his name already, who, um, who has been like studying these things for 20 years and says for the last 2,000 years that has been the issue of translation. So but I'm going to end it today. <laughs> so um, first I just want to say, um, as a just kind of, you know, thing, is this it? glasses with the thing? It's okay. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, about translation of texts, and that's the subject actually pretty much, right? We're not talking about oral translation of today, mm -hmm. tonight. Is that in any case, if you're a translator, you're a textualist. And that has a lot of limitation in itself. Um, uh, and it's just what we do, uh, and not any different from any other language, but except that we don't have, what we analyze uh, in a text is all we've got, and it may be completely wrong, because we're not there then, on the ground, in the field, for Buddhist practices. And there's been a tendency in, in Buddhist studies from day one, really, of, well, especially, I'd say, since Sanskrit was deciphered, you know, that the real Buddhism, that somehow the real Buddhism is in the original text, which, of course, we also now know don't, they're, you know, original texts you'll never find, but, um, and that what the actual Buddhist practitioners were doing out there was maybe completely wrong because it wasn't what's in the text. So it's almost like a kind of colonial attitude or Protestant attitude type of thing. And um, I just want to point out that limitation. You know, everything is going to be textual analysis. That's just our limitation. It may not have anything to do with real people. <laughs> um, so this, to tackle this myth of literalism, um, uh, you know, most, I think most of us in the field and in like Tibetan Buddhism in general, practitioners as well as translators and scholars, sort of went along for a lot of years thinking that, you know, we were inventing the wheel and never really looked outside of our little thing. And then recently, because we've been imposed upon by all these things like translation conferences and stuff, we've had to look. And lo and behold, people have been talking about translation a lot over the last couple of millennia, and especially lately, seriously. And um, actually, Marcus made a, you know, a kind of possible reading list if you're interested to read some of the um, other issues about translation that have come up, and a lot of them uh, are 
you know, the same issues, even though the languages can be quite similar. You know, you could go from Spanish to Italian, which is just basically, you just change a few things. But, <laughs> you know, and, but it's still the same issues. Um, and so one of the conclusions that almost any commentator on the theory of translation has come up with is that there is no such thing as a literal translation. There's just no such thing. And I'm going to go back to that. But first, and w I want to take this little, you know, um, expedition into history a little bit because some Tibetan translators and Sanskrit translators have also thought that um, this has something to do with this age-old discussion in Tibet between so-called word translation, sikjur, and uh, meaning translation, dunjur. Those words are fairly recent in Tibetan history, I found, and I noticed that in researching it, and also um, recently, um, um, you know, confirmed by Geshe Thupten Jimpa. Um, so Tsikjur, that's just made up recently. It was actually Drajur or something like that. Um, uh, and I think that the current modern discussion, this is what I'm proposing, of literalism versus creative translation really has nothing to do with that, but in order to prove that, I have to first talk about that. So, <laughs> or not prove it, but it's just my idea. Um, but it's not just the, you know, the Tibetan sort of myths about this. Um, we can go back all the way to, well, I like this story of the so, you know, the 72 Jews who were supposed to translate the old Book of Moses, uh, they were brought together, and, and this is a quote, it says, let's see if I can see it. Uh, this, this is found in the tractate, the Megillah of the Babylonian Talmud, and it said, quote, King Ptolemy once gathered 72 elders. He placed them in 72 chambers, each of them in a separate one without revealing to them why they were summoned. He entered each one's room and said, write for me the Torah of Moshe, your teacher. God put it in the heart of each one to translate identically as all the others did. So I, maybe some of you have heard the story of Sami Ling and the translation, I think was it 500 or 108 or something, translators, same story. They all translated separately a tract out of Sanskrit, and they all turned out identical. It's really interesting. 500 Tibetans versus 72 Jews, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, and I, the interesting thing is that someone had, had a house with 72 rooms. But anyway, um, that, and that is called the Septuagint, which means 70. So Wollstone Fletcher, who you might remember, did this thing a little while ago, and um, he said they had to fire two of them so it sounded better. <laughs> but <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, then, so that was the translation from Hebrew to Greek. Then one person, and this will maybe bear on our later subject of whether to do things in groups or by one. Then one person, Jerome, Saint Jerome, translated it into Latin. And um, before I even knew, so Saint Jerome is the patron saint of translators. Um, and I brought a picture of him so you would know. <laughs> this, I, before I knew that that was the case, th I, this, I actually saw this in uh, the, um, there's more floor seating up here, but I don't know what you want to do about that. Um, and this is in Rome, and this is him. So he's, I would have had a PowerPoint, but I was told I wouldn't be allowed. Um, so he's really old. And, you know, he's reading the book and writing with his feather quill at the same time. And then death is there by him. And so that feels a lot like a good patron saint to me of translating. <laughs> he also doesn't have good clothes and stuff. But, um, <clears throat> and Wollstone also told me that St. Jerome, you know, was a pretty strange guy. And while the world fell apart around him, he thought the most important thing was to maintain your virginity. I don't know, maybe that's true. But <laughs> so, so I first heard, Oh, what else did he tell me? Oh, yeah. 
he told me, uh, this is a, something else from Wilson. He said, the, who you know was a monk before, but you know, Jesuit monk. The fact that the apostles and New Testament authors felt comfortable under the direction of the Holy Spirit in using the Septuagint should give us assurance that a translation of the original languages of the Bible is still the authoritative word of God. So remember that. Um, so then to go to the Tibetan issue, uh, I first heard, I saw this, this problem of Dunjur and Sikjur, translating the meaning or translating the word, I first heard about it from one of my teachers, Chakdu Rinpoche. And, and he was in discussion, I think, with Lama Tarchan and maybe, I can't remember if Nosho Kempa was there that year, <clears throat> Lama Sona, some of, you know, they were all talking. And what they were saying is this, the galupas are burning the translations of the word translate, of the meaning translations. So I got really rightfully outraged when I heard that, and I went on a kind of rampage of, okay, everything should be meaning translation. Because at that time, I didn't understand the full implication of the sort of sectarian you know, world that goes on like that. And I carried that around for a long time, and in fact, I asked Trungpa Rinpoche, and I think you might have been there, but you probably don't remember it, no. but it was at his house, <laughs> and uh, I asked him, so what do you think, you know, is it Dunju or Tsikju? And he thought about that for a while, and he said, well, I think you can do both. And, um, but I never did know if he meant one can do both, or, you know, I can do, me can do both. And so I still will never know, and I still kind of try to. So this is an odd, I'm actually arguing on the other side tonight um, because I just want to like put this to rest, but um, I actually really do try and stick very close, but that doesn't mean word for word. There's just nothing like word for word. Um, um, so in investigating this issue in Tibet, I went back to um, a text, a lexicon, which is called the Mahavupati, uh, which I think might be the beginning of where this started, um, and particularly a, the, a Tibetan introduction to it, and, um, which is called the Drajar Bambu Nipa. And um, this is something that was ordered by uh, the king after Trisong Dets and his son, the next king, to kind of standardize Tibetan translation. And um, uh, this is, came at about 150 years after translation work had begun in Tibet. And so, uh, you know, they felt that there were a lot of um, problems. And I actually have a translation of that introduction to the lexicon, which I had to print it all out because it's, sort of weird, um, like it only prints out on like, it looks big, but it only prints out like that for some reason. But it has both the Tibetan and the English. And um, so who, you all can probably guess what we now call the translations that came before the Mahavutpati. What are they called? Yeah, and what comes after Ngajur? Nyingma, Nyingma. That was the problem. And so this is why I don't really like this old debate in Tibet because I feel like it's really caught up in this kind of, you know, attitude. However, this introduction to the Mahavudpata, which the Mahavudpata is just a list of words with um, the things that you can translate, and you didn't have any choice, because this was an edict by the king. Um, uh, uh, you mind if I read you a little bit of this? Is okay? Okay. The king requested the preceptors from the West, so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, as well as the learned translator so-and-so, and authors and others to translate from Indic languages into Tibetan the terminologies of the great and small vehicles to define the terms and make a written word list. The decree was issued that, quote, one shall never deviate from this list and make it suitable for everybody to learn. And, it's in, and then there's a list of 
the problem translators. And they include some of the great translators, uh, starting with Shantarakshita, which is sort of a surprise, you know. He's here, Acharya Bodhisattva, Yashe Wangpo, Zangyanyena, and so on and so forth um, of the early translation. And it says, some of these were not in accordance with the Dharma text and the principles of a grammatical theory. And um, Odrashindu is what it was called, not Sikjur. Um, so they have been fixed, taking the literal expression as the main criteria. Um, and then it goes on how you have no choice. And there's a great deal of detail in this, what you should do. Um, regarding the weight of translating the true dharma, do not contradict the meaning and adhere to good Tibetan usage. That seems to contradict, yes? Doesn't it? I mean, it's not that clear. And then later on, uh, there's so many pages here, and I just only wanted a few words from it, and I'm just too, too lazy. Um, later on, it specifically mentions that quite the opposite of what was going on here. Yeah, I can't find it, but I know what it says. That in the translation of the tantras, the literal translations were all wrong by translating the words of the tantras, they miss the meaning. So it's not even as, as uh, tight as all that. Um, and I also have a little, another edict. It's good, these edicts, you know, that like, you probably have heard this. So then, after this, after the so-called fragmentation or dark, ages, long dharma, and everything, and then the whole second spreading of the dharma and the second translation efforts, uh, one of the sort of um, ancestors, uh, you know, descendants of the kings, Lhalama uh, Yeshe said, this is his edict, now as the good karma of living beings is exhausted and the law of the kings is impaired because the empire fell, right, uh, the old empire, false doctrines called Dzogchen, are flourishing in Tibet. Their views are false and wrong. Heretical tantras pretending to be Buddhist are spread in Tibet. Village abbots, their tantrist way of practicing will shock the people of other countries when they hear of it. These practices of you who say we are Buddhists shall show less compassion than a demon of action, more avaricious for meat than a hawk or a wolf, more lusty than a mere donkey or an ox, those who wish to be Mahayanist must accumulate the two kinds of merit and abandon the notion of grasping at that which is to be grasped, must practice the ten paramita, almsgiving, etc., must achieve all the practices of a bodhisattva, must accomplish the welfare of living beings through love and compassion. If you practice religion in this way, you will be Mahayanist. So that was the edict by Lala Miyeshe and after that he came Atisha, and uh, really the first translator in Western Tibet uh, who marks the beginning of, um, you know, the new wave of translation, which was Atisha, and Rinshin Tsangpo, his translator. And, um, and then there's another one in the East, Shmriti Kirti. So everything from him later in the east of Tibet and from um, Rinchen Zangpo in the west of Tibet onwards is considered new translation. And supposedly they're sticking to this Mahavutpati. So what was the result of all that? Um, translations from Sanskrit to Tibetan basically, I mean, I don't, here's the Sanskritist, so I don't know Sanskrit, but I can instantly tell if I'm reading a text that's been translated from Sanskrit. Why? Because the Tibetan is so terrible. It's not anything a Tibetan would ever write or say or, you know, or possibly understand. So it kind of means that it's good if you know Sanskrit to read that Tibetan, but then why would you? Why, 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 <laughs> you know, why not read the Sanskrit? Now it ended up, it's, and, and they're very accurate, um, and there are several uh, projects to retranslate uh, from Tibetan back to Sanskrit that 
that um, supposedly works. There's been positive response about that. <laughs> Not so well. A little. But how would we know? Because we don't have the original Sanskrit. But nevertheless, maybe that is possible. Um, but and it ended up being a really good thing for you know his historical purposes since so much of the Sanskrit originals were lost. And, and not lost in Tibet. So that in, in that case, it was a very good thing. And it kind of reminds me a little bit, like reading those texts, you know, if you have to learn another language in order to read the, did you guys ever read all like Herbert Gunther's translation? <laughs> <laughs> you know, great translator, great scholar. But you have to know this other language, maybe you have to know German <laughs> or something to really understand what he's trying to say. So is that a a translation, or is that the purpose of translation, or would we want to do that? Um, so I, you know, the the fact that there's this kind of mix up with uh, uh, this sectarian problems that happened later in Tibet between early translations and early practices and later ones, uh, and also the fact that those are not uh, all that useful except to create a very learned elite. Um, in a country where not that many people were literate, it made more sense. You know, that just a few people, okay, we can figure this out. But I don't think that, that discussion really pertains right now to us. Um, and for two reasons, it just will never happen. One is we're not going to get any royal edicts. You know, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> Even if people wanted to, they, it's not going to happen. Uh, and... And secondly, another thing is that the Tibetan translators have some kind of permission to just make up words. You know, for the Sanskrit, it's a very different language, Tibetan, than Sanskrit. And when they needed one, they, they would just make up some new words, and then it would go in this lexicon in the Mahavudpati. And we, we re really can't do that. I mean, we have new words in English all the time, but we don't just decide, you know, they just happen from the culture and everything. So um, barring those two things, a royal edict and um, the permission to make up words, I don't think we're ever going to even get close, and uh, let alone to keep things um, grammatically in the same order. In the Mahavudpati introduction, it says you can, if you really have to change the grammar, you know, from the Sanskrit to Tibetan is in verse, it's okay, but only within one shloka, only within one verse. So four line quatrain, you might have to like move it around. Otherwise it has to be boom, 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 you know. And then in, in prose, nope, no change. Actually the same word order. So I think we can not have that discussion. <laughs> I mean, we can if you want, but I don't, I don't think that's what people are talking about now. When they talk about literal translation, even though people keep bringing it up and really hoping, wishing with all good motivation and heart that somehow we can make these perfect, exact translations. I mean, you know, can you imagine taking some of our translations in English and trying to put them back in Tibetan and then checking with Tibetan? And, or even, I mean, I'm like delighted if I find even one sentence of another translator's that resembles the one I did, because then I think, oh, well, I must have gotten it right. <laughs> you know, but it doesn't, it almost never happens, or even a few, like two or three words in a row. Um, and then I always think, well, maybe they stole it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, there's a great book on translation by uh, uh, Sake Pandita. He was, you know, big on talking about translation. It's called Dharma's Gatekeepers. Um, it's uh, gold, uh, something gold. Um, Jonathan Gold, thanks. And, um, but he says, the official choice to prefer reflective authenticity, reflective back to Sanskrit, authenticity over target language comprehensibility would prove a decisive factor in the development of later Tibetan intellectual traditions, and that is certainly true. Um, and from another, another, another uh, article I found that's called, Do the Tibetan Translations of Indian Buddhist Texts Provide Guidelines for Contemporary Translators? 
Well, I'm going to say, you know, my answer is no. <laughs> um, but this author, Gaffner, Gaffney, says the great, ex no, he didn't say that. He said, um, the language that was evolved for this translation process has been called an artificial language in that it is very literalness, grammar, vocabulary, and style. It is totally alien to any of the indigenous written Tibetan styles. The result is a language that could not easily be read by a Tibetan who is not familiar with the vocabulary and syntax of this specialized translation language. Um, oh yeah, so it was, and it was George Steiner who said, over some 2,000 years of argument and precept, he wrote, with perceptible frustration, the beliefs and disagreements voiced about the nature of translation have been almost the same. <sighs> so, <laughs> now to the present a little bit. Um, there's a book, David Bellows, some of you met him last time we did that translation conference, it's called, Is That a Fish in Your Ear? He has a whole chapter which is called The Myth of Literal Translation. And I just have a few words from him. Um, he said, words taken one by one obscure the force and meaning of a text, which is why a word-for-word -word translation is almost never a good job. And he also said, few commentators on translation have ever come out in favor of a literal or word-for-word -word style. Uh, and he, he, he did translate this, so back to St. Jerome. Uh, St. Jerome was also having this problem. He called it from word, I think from word to word or sense to sense. And then he said, he said, I, then this is Bellos' translation, but now Wollstone has told me that Bellos' Latin is really bad. So <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. But he said, I translate word for word, this is St. Jerome, in Bellos' translation, where, where the, only where the original, even in its word order, is completely impenetrable to me. Now, of course, there's been, and the word he used was mystere, and there's been all kinds of arguments about what that word meant when he said it. So they're arguing about the translation of the words the, of his theory of translation, and they're not sure what he meant. <laughs> um, and so here's Bellos's take on it, which is, of course, what translators have always done, for the most part, they transmit the sense where the sense is obscure, the best they can do, because they're not allowed to skip anything, is to offer a representation of the separate words of the original. So basically, if you're doing that, it's a kind of a cop-out, or, you know, it's the best you can do. It's not a cop-out, it's like the best you can do, although I have seen translators who leave things out altogether if they can't understand them. A, a lot, I've seen that. Because, of course, I go and look. When I can't understand something, I go and see if someone else has figured it out and it's just not there at all. Um, so he says the terms of debate about translation and meaning need to be updated, and the long-lasting scrap between literal and free should now be laid to rest. Uh, that's probably not going to happen. I missed my favorite quote. Where did it go? By this Mexican... Uh, writer, uh, no, it's in here somewhere. Oh uh, yeah, it's Octa Octavio Paz, mm -hmm. do you know of him? Mm -hmm. So this is my final like statement. He says, I'm not saying a literal translation is impossible, only that it's not a translation. So I think that's <laughs> perfect. Of course, he said it in Spanish. I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 but, um, so, you know, that's kind of my, I mean, there's a lot, lot more. We could talk about it in, in Bellos and other translation theorists, of which I am not one, um, have, give lots and lots and lots of examples of this, of very simple statements. And didn't one of the doctors do a thing about ama in Tibetan, the word ama, and how that's not, you can't say mother, that's like a wrong translation. So, um, you know, there's a million examples that if we had time, because it, it makes more sense when you... So, Saint Jerome, I'd like to propose a new saint of translation. <laughs> I have a picture of this one too. Ooh. 
if you recognize her. <laughs> you mm. don't, huh? Mm. I know you don't. This is Masande. No, I don't. Game of Thrones. She, I mean, she definitely looks better than St. Jerome, don't you think? I mean, mm. wouldn't you rather pray to her? <laughs> and, uh, but here's the thing. She's a, she was a slave, which also is quite fitting, mm. I think. Oh, yeah. And <laughs> it reminds me of the, uh, you know, the Dil Oglan, or the language boys in Turkey that were stolen from other lands and forced to be translators. So that's our new patron saint. That's my new patron saint. <laughs> and if you have a chance, you can look her up. And there's a great scene where she's translating for this horrible, like, slave master. And he's saying all these really rude, lewd, horrible things about her, you know, calling her own, you know, the whore and this and that and this. And, and then, not her, but her, bought this other woman, you know. And then the translator is completely diplomatic about it, you know, like. He says he would like to offer you something, something about this son of a bitch, you know. So that's also a translator's job. <laughs> so that's all I have to say. Mm. What do you okay. think? <laughs> Got number one out of the way. Well, I'm not going to argue with you. Okay. Uh, yeah, you better. Because I, I agree with all that. And I'm not really all that interested in that topic. <laughs> well, you know, it's an <laughs> academic topic, really. Uh, practically speaking, I don't think it has a lot of relevance. But, for example, I, I, I want to talk about the group process of translation. Yeah. That's, that's my topic. Um, Sarah was going to deal with the first question. I, gonna do I knew rest. I would agree with her. <laughs> but it is worth noting, I just want to say a couple little things, as someone who has studied Sanskrit some, but I'm not a Sanskrit translator. I'm not competent, really, to translate from Sanskrit. It's really difficult. But whenever we have worked on Tibetan texts uh, that we have Sanskrit orig so-called originals, we will try to read them. And it's really interesting to do that. It's not easy. And we have to choose which text are we going to translate because they are often at least a little different. They're always a little different. And they're sometimes completely different, sometimes uh, missing things or different things. You mean which edition of a text? Well, if Is you have you more meant? than one. No, oh, I actually oh, mean, okay. you know, and one of the problems here, uh, which Sarah kind of mentioned briefly, um, is that we have a wealth of Tibetan texts, and we do not have nearly as many of these texts from the Sanskrit. They're mostly gone. We still have hundreds of them maybe even thousands, but we certainly don't have most of them. Uh, so when we don't have the text, we have no choice but to rely on the Tibetan or maybe Chinese and others. But, and in those cases, um, as Sarah explained, a lot of the canonical sutra, they call it sutra Tibetan, mm. is very stilted, it's very artificial. Um, it is the most classical of classical Tibetan. And you can approximate what might have been in the Sanskrit. Verbal prefixes, for example, are, are slavishly translated into Tibetan uh, particles, which then have whole different meanings because uh, in Sanskrit, sometimes the verbal prefix does a lot and sometimes it does nothing. You have to know the Sanskrit. The Tibetans who were translators, they knew Sanskrit. They knew what to do with them. And they, f for one reason or another, decided to slavishly re reproduce them even though the Tibetan becomes misleading as a result. Uh, but because of that, there are uh, some sort of clues to be able to reconstruct the Sanskrit as a result of that. And that is to some degree possible. But, and I've never tried to reconstruct the Sanskrit text. And I've heard that some are fairly successful, but it's hard to believe it's that accurate. Uh, and I have read some articles about how horrific it is, in fact. <laughs> and the myth, the myth, it really is a myth, that Tibetan translators were amazing because you can then translate back into the original. Well, I agree they were amazing. I don't think there's any question what they accomplished is amazing. 
a humongous amount of work and of very high quality, but it's not perfect. Far from literal, can't be. We know now, you've proven, <laughs> it can't be, and it isn't. So, but it is really interesting and useful that if you have um, a Sanskrit original and you're working in the Tibetan, our committee, the Nalanda Translation Committee, long ago kind of just decided we would translate to Tibetan because that for us is a living tradition that has, in some cases, people who actually know the text in question and there's no living tradition of Indian literature. You know, it's a big break from about 1200. That's it. Gone. Done. Nobody alive anymore. Uh, even though there are lots of panditas and uh, brahmins that know Sanskrit well, might be helpful, but they don't really know this literature. So we decided we would translate the Tibetan with reference to Sanskrit, mm -hmm. uh, and when there are differences, what do we do? And it's always painful and difficult, and there isn't a rule. Mm. Uh, there were a number of interesting examples I didn't bring with me, and it would be too boring to go through, but where sometimes the Tibetan you would normally read in one way, but if you look at the Sanskrit and see, yeah, it really doesn't mean that. However, perhaps the Tibetan could be read the way the Sanskrit is. It's just unusual. Mm. In those cases, we use the Sanskrit, you know, kind of interpretation or meaning because the Tibetan supports it, even though you would never know that if you didn't know the Sanskrit. So that's an interesting mm. uh, when we encounter that. I, I think that's very cool. Uh, however, we have no idea if the Sanskrit that is extant is actually the original that was translated. Mm. <laughs> Big question. Uh, and very difficult to ascertain. So, enough, <laughs> if you don't mind. Let's move on to number two. <laughs> oh, I thought that was number two. No, okay. that's not number two. Okay, go to number two. So number two is about <laughs> how, how people work. Do they work in a group? Do they work alone? Well, I represent a group that works in a group, but we do most of our work alone. <laughs> Uh, because that's the way everything has to happen. I mean, how could you, I mean, you don't want people sitting around, you know, uh, too, destruct, uh, too distracting to really work together through the whole process. So I thought it would be helpful, maybe interesting, to describe our methodology as a group style of uh, translation process. Individually, usually, one of us will be the sort of main translator of a text. We will draft it alone, doing our best to come up with some kind of a translation, knowing full well that it's going to go through many other iterations with other people. So at least in my approach, I don't work that hard on it because I know how much it's going to change. But you want to do your best. And so someone will put, produce a draft, if it's a really big text, we might divide it up and different people take different sections. That happens too. But in any event, an individual drafts something. And then what we often do is we come together. Sometimes we review our drafts just among the translators, but most times we don't, somewhat because it takes yet even more time. And usually what we do is we then sit down with a bilingual llama. Somebody, Sarah had, I thought, the best way to frame this question, but I think Mark has cleaned it up. But I like Sarah's. Group translation with overlord <laughs> versus isolated individual. <laughs> this is why we love Sarah. Right to the point. And this is it. You know, do you have an overlord or not? <laughs> We did. We did, and, and we do, sort of. Not like we did, but at any rate. So we come together with a bilingual lama, a lama whose native language is Tibetan. Hopefully, they're learned. Hopefully, they're a good meditator. They have some experience of meditation, especially if you're working on meditative texts and not philosophical texts. 
and we read the text, we read our draft to that Lama word by word. Usually the Lama is reading the Tibetan, that's what they have in front of them, and we're reading in English, and they understand the English well enough to follow along, and it is very common that we don't get it all right, and that they will say, oh, no, 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 it's uh, something else. And there begins the process of correcting the draft. We ideally like to have, I would say three or four people is ideal. One person is not enough in our process. It's too hard to keep track of everything mm -hmm. when it really is only one person. It is incredibly helpful to have at least two. I prefer three or four. Once you get beyond four, too many minds, too many cooks, but sometimes that can be useful. Uh, certainly with Trungpa Rinpoche, we sometimes had seven or eight people. Most of them were often quiet, but not always. And we go through the process of literally reading the entire draft in English out loud while the Lama is reading the Tibetan and trying to see, is it the same meaning? All sorts of conversations happen. Usually the original translator has many questions that they scratch their heads about, want to know, well, what does this really mean? And does this thing over here affect that over here? And how do these lines fit together? And there's a million different things that you would want to ask about. And so this process is very slow, and, but it's really interesting. Because here's where you're really learning mm -hmm. what a native person, one native person, thinks about a particular text. Hopefully, that llama, that native informant is what they call them in the, the linguistic world, <coughs> really knows the text. Mm -hmm. In our case, Trungpa Rinpoche often really knew many of the texts we worked on, most of them maybe, but I would say many of our Lama helpers sometimes had never seen the text before. And yet, they're intelligent readers, like we might be intelligent readers of English, and as a result of that, they have a good idea of what it means, they might know more about the context, and they might not. There might be idiomatic expressions that are native to a particular region of where the writer was from that are very misleading to someone not from there, uh, or just uh, strange. Uh, we certainly have experienced that. But at any rate, we go over the text very carefully with a bilingual llama. <coughs> and for your information, Trungpa Rinpoche did this with us, but not at that stage. We used to do this primarily with Lama Ujjan, Shen Pen. Um, his English at first was non-existent. When he came to us, he didn't know a word of English. <coughs> but he learned enough. His <coughs> English was never great, I would say. He wasn't real fluent in his expression, but his understanding was incredibly good. Mm. And he he got used to us, and he learned our Dharma vocabulary of how we translated. So he actually knew a lot of English and was very quick to know where we were not quite right. We taped those meetings, <clears throat> and we then, in a very tedious, slow process, the original translator of the draft will go back and listen to the recordings, type up hundreds of footnotes, of what, what was said and what did Lama so-and-so say, uh, what further questions does the original draft translator have, because there are always going to be more questions. And then, in the old days, we would then go to Trungpa Rinpoche. So by the time we went to him, it was pretty good, usually. Mm -hmm. I would say it was probably 90% of the way there, 80 to 90% but we would do the exact same thing with him. We read him every single word of English. He sat with the Tibetan, and there were times, there were times when Lama Ujin really didn't know. There were times when Trungpa Rinpoche thought it meant something different. Sometimes uh, Ujin and Rinpoche would converse about it. Uh, we all would have a lot of discussions. I would say we had probably less uh, fewer questions of the literal, what does this word mean, 
but many more questions about what is the sense of this. Yeah. And Trung Rinpoche was extremely interested in what is the reader going to think by us saying such and such? What, do, what are they going to like hear by having this? And that was very interesting to him. And we spent a lot of time talking about, well, how would this be understood by the reader? Where we worked at his residence, where Sarah visited a couple times, we always had the uh, full volume, 13 volume OED, not the condensed thing that you need a microscope for. Uh, and we many times went to the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, to look up a word. We were never trying to use extremely arcane, you know, ancient meanings of things. We wanted things to be current and, and uh, you know, maybe liter a little more literary than conversational, but still normal vocabulary. Uh, not overly intellectual or academic is where we were aiming for. And so we would do the same process with another bilingual llama and one who had you know, un undoubtedly greater realization and learning than the first one did. That wasn't always true, by the way. Sometimes the so-called authority is less um, studied, learned, than your other informants, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But for one reason or another, that other person is the where the buck stops. Overlord. Hmm? Overlord. Overlord. <laughs> <laughs> I like to think that the main reason they're the overlord is because they have some special relationship to actually the text sure. as opposed to the people. <laughs> they're mm -hmm. not just lording over us, but they, they actually have some special relationship. And the perfect example for us right now, in fact, is we're working a lot with Trungpa Rinpoche's nephew, Karma Senge Rinpoche, mm -hmm. who is you know, moderately learned and well-studied, but not Shedra trained. Mm -hmm. He didn't have that, the benefit of that. He grew up in communist China. There were no Shedras in his youth. He got as good an education as he could, and he did pretty well, considering he's very well practiced. Uh, he, he seems to have a lot of uh, real understanding of the Dharma. As he himself says, I don't really know much, but what I know, I know quite well. Mm -hmm. And he's not being at all arrogant about that. But we often will read that same text with Kenpo Tsering from Sermang, who is a Kenpo, has good training, and in many ways knows a lot of things that maybe Karma Senge Rinpoche doesn't know. Mm -hmm. Karma Senge Rinpoche respects Kenpo Tsering quite a bit. They're good friends. And he knows. He's a good Kenpo. He knows a lot of these things. And it's a lot of fun to watch them argue. <laughs> and they argue. And Kempo, oh, he's got all sorts of ideas. Kempo loses 90-some percent of the arguments, <laughs> mostly because the Kempo actually has never seen these texts before. Mm -hmm. He knows nothing about them inherently. He's just a smart guy reading a book. Karma Senge Rinpoche knows these texts very well. Now, he never met his uncle, Drunga Rinpoche, who wrote them. So he doesn't know from the horse's mouth what they mean, but he's learned whatever he could from the disciples of Trungpa Rinpoche. And because he's literally the only person alive that has that connection with these mm. texts, he's our overlord. Uh, and it's not really because we have that guru-disciple thing with him, though we, we, we do a little bit. It's because he carries some kind of authority with the text that no one alive does. So I like to think it's a good example where he may not be the smartest person about something, but he really feels like he knows the intent. There's a lot of other processes that happen after this. Again, we listen to all the tapes, make more footnotes, more questions come up. We go back to one or both of the lamas, and after all of those questions, we then sit down without the lamas, and the three or four, five of us Western translators then begin a process that is very tedious, if it, the other wasn't, where we decide what are we really going to say, and what do we think of how it flows.
if it's like for us, we do a lot of liturgical translations, chanting, things that people are going to practice in their meditation. We do not translate into real verse. There's a couple passages that one of our translators, Ives Waldo, is incredible. He can write any English verse form almost effortlessly. He helped to versify a couple sections of one text, but mostly we don't do that. It is very tedious. But we translate into what we call free verse, and does it scan well? Does it chant well? Does it mean, still mean the right thing? So sometimes we actually to, together will chant something to see how it sounds. So it's a long process of editing, and it, that is very much a group process. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, that's an example of a group approach, and I think the highlight of this is our insistence on reading every word to at least one bilingual lama. Karma Sangha Rinpoche doesn't know any English. Yeah. He doesn't help with that. So all we can do is ask him questions about things and have him, like, what is this about? And he'll give a teaching, maybe. He cannot help with the English. Kembo's good with English. So maybe that's enough. A little bit of a group approach. Overlord, and the, guru, whatever you want to call them. I think I was thinking of Padma Kara when I said that. Were you? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, well, as I... I'm always bemoaning uh, all through that last translation conference. I wish I had a Kempo in the basement that I could just bring up. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, and yeah. also bilingual llamas are pretty rare that are learned. Uh, yes. Very rare. So I don't have that luxury. Yeah. I mean, everyone, all Tibetans think that's the best way in a group without exception. Yeah. And we tried it with Kala Rinpoche when we started the Treasury of Knowledge, um, God, it was just so... We would not be done yet yeah. if we'd continued that. Yeah. As it was, it was 12 years or something that to finish the Treasury of Knowledge, and Kala Rinpoche was so anxious for us to finish it before he died, and we didn't because we were working in a group. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, it's ideal, and people who have never translated always will say, of course, you should do it in a group. But it's yeah. just it's just the practical side of it is hard. But I would say yeah. that you, you can't do without a Tibetan informant. You yes. can't. Nobody can. Yeah. Um, but I have never, ever read a whole translation through to a bilingual lama. Oh, yeah. that would be like my greatest fantasy. Yeah, yeah. In the first book I did, Creation Completion, the only bilingual llama I knew was, um, what's his name, in, out in Massachusetts. Tukutundrup? Yes, Tukutundrup. Tukutundrup. Yeah. So I sent him the draft, you know, the first thing. He came back, he had one comment on one word, which was, I remember the word, it was rangyupa, hmm. which he just said meant normal. He says, it means normal. Hmm. And then I said, well, oh my God, I don't think I can, you know, Oh my God, there's probably so many mistakes. You know, I shouldn't put it. He goes, No, it's time to put it out there. You just have to get it out there. Hmm. You know, like with mistakes or not. And so that was the only time I ever hmm. even found a bilingual. Where do you find them? I don't know. It's, it's, it is often hard to find them. Well, Ujin came to us. Yeah. He came to us. Uh, and it's a really amazingly good thing that he did. We had to teach him English, yeah. so he didn't come to us as a bilingual lama, but yeah. he actually learned, and he learned enough to be incredibly helpful. Yeah. You knew Ujin. Yeah, he, he was not greatly yeah. learned. He was yeah. not Shedra trained. He was well-practiced. He happened to sit at the feet of for you know, 14, Rinpoche, 15 yeah. years of Dilgo Kensi Rinpoche. Yeah, that was, was really helpful. Shafshi. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, he learned a huge amount being yeah. with Kensa Rinpoche. I mean, I guess I worked that way with Chakta Rinpoche. Uh, but yeah. but his English, he wouldn't even <laughs> know the words, but he would make me say them, and he would somehow, you know, <laughs> decide which one it should be because yeah. it sounded right. And I I don't know, you know, he was. I'm sure he was right, but he's the only one that would ever. Uh, hmm. spend that much time. Yeah. It takes enormous, enormous amount, of amount of time. I mean, you're right. I mean, if we had done the Shejatsu, 
Oh, you'd still be on like oh volume my God. one. Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. I don't. I mean, that's like a thirty-year project. And that also makes a difference. Oh, How yes. much are you going to translate? That's are right. you going to spend, yep. you know, five years on a ten-page text and make it just fabulous? And that's everybody's dream to be able to yeah. do that. But it's yeah. uh, no, nobody. Most people don't have. I mean, that luxury. our overlord. <laughs> Yeah. Doesn't wants to see product, yeah. <laughs> you know, not just. Uh, yep. oh, I'm still really enjoying this. Yeah. You know, so. you know, part of the reason, by the way, that we do what we do. I mean, it really came very organically because when we started, we didn't know enough to work on our own. I mean, very simply, we we really were too uh, apprentice-like. So we were Trung Rinpoche's apprentices, and yeah. he was really the translator. Yeah. And, you know, his, his command of English, oh, his vocabulary was immense. Yeah. But his syntax was all over the place. Someday it would be perfect. I have heard him give perfect English paragraphs, but it usually was not. It was not native English, and he needed Western, you know, sure. native English Ed editors, editors, for yeah. sure. And we were his editors learning to be translators. So it was a, you know, it was a, we were growing into it with him. Uh, so that's how it happened. Then Ujin came along and uh, he learned enough English to be helpful fairly quickly because he was a bright guy. Um, but the, the point I want to make is the vast majority of what our committee worked on uh, and still does are practice texts that people recite hundreds and thousands of times. Mm. And most of the in people fact, doing that. hundred thousand times. Right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and they even count how many times. <laughs> how strange that is. <laughs> and because, you know, 99.999% of those people in at least the Shambhala community do not know any Tibetan, this is all they got. Yeah. They have no other resource. And, you know, they're trying to get enlightened. <laughs> Right? I'm sort of, or at least that's kind of the idea. And if you get one thing wrong, they might not get in. It like could it. be all our fault. <laughs> that's right. So we want the person taking that responsibility to be the overlord yeah. and not us. That's really the reason, because they're the guru person. Yeah. They're the lama. They're the person who actually has the authority to teach the students. I mean, certainly in the case of Trungpa Rinpoche, it made sense. I mean, there's like no question it worked. And it was a lot of fun. He, you know, it wasn't like, you know, we like argued a little and then he decided. It never worked that way. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I would say at least 60 to 80% of the time, somebody else came up with what was the final word. And there were moments when he would have to decide because he did know better than we did. And you know, it was interesting. Uh, a couple of our members were occasionally would disagree with him. And he loved people disagreeing. That was not a problem, and we would argue. But at some point, you got to kind of finish it. And if you left the meeting and you still were kind of bothered by this, what do you do? Well, when Dilga Kensa Rinpoche came the second time to North America, one of, our, one of my colleagues asked him that question. You know, what do you do when you're in the meeting and you disagree with your guru, you know, f with whom you have this very important relationship? And Kensa Rinpoche said, well, he's the guru, but you should not in any way ever give up your intelligence about this. You should kind of maybe file it, or I don't know what he said. <laughs> footnote, you know, footnote. Yeah, keep, keep it in mind. and. After the meeting, think about it more. Give more thought to it. You know, contemplate it a little further. And if, in fact, you still really think what was decided was not right or not the best, then you look for the right time and bring it up again. Don't just let it go. Huh. So I, that's pretty good. And I thought that very wise, and we have done that. So. Because of the liturgy, um, I mean, the commentaries are also important, but the fact that you're reciting these things over and over again, 
Of course, there's lots of different ways to say the same thing. Everybody's got their style. We have a particular style. It's not an issue of right or wrong. It's just stylistic. Um, but if we make mistakes, we want to be corrected. So we jokingly call ourselves, you know, we have the old translation school and the new translation school. We are the retranslation school. <laughs> and, we, you know, we try not to do it very often. Some of our public thinks we do it too often, but in fact, we really don't. It's very, you know, we give it years before we make corrections, unless it's really serious, then we'll tell them right away. Because sometimes people have memorized these things, mm -hmm. and when you change it, it's like, why did you do that? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, you know. But we do have the history. The long run is the most important. And, you know, once we were working on a, a fire puja text for the Vajrayogini practice, and Rinpoche had come to a Vajrayogini feast for the very first time after about two years of his students doing this practice, he had actually never witnessed his students practicing. We learned it mostly from His Holiness Karmapa's monks, uh, who happened to be visiting at the time in 1977, where Rinpoche came to a feast. And after that, during our translation meetings, like every five or 10 minutes, he would say, now why did you do such and such? Now, it wasn't about the words. He had been the translator of the words. It was more the ritual. Yeah. You know, you went with Anjali, or you held the Vajra this way instead of this way, or I don't know. There were a lot of things we did that seemed odd to him. And we said, well, you know, sir, maybe we could go over this with you. Like, let's go over the whole text, and you tell us the right way. And we did. We then spent about five weeks from cover to cover, the whole practice, and we changed an enormous amount of ritual because it was different in the way he was taught, and we learned a lot about the meaning, which the monks never told us. Uh, so it was really, really profitable that we did this. Well, one of the translators was extremely disturbed by the fact that we were making all these mistakes, quote unquote, and he said to Rinpoche, Rinpoche, some of us have been practicing this for years, two at the most, it wasn't that long. <laughs> How should we think of our mistakes that we've been making. And Rinpoche, over his glasses, I suppose you could regard it as sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. You want to talk about being an individual translator? Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, there's just, there's not much choice. I mean, that's, a, I don't, I'm not a proponent of it, particularly, uh, Although I was going to ask you, well, how do you have a style among, say, four or five people? That's a, yeah. uh, I mean, that's one thing. Uh, and again, I, uh, you know, group translations, the downside is that it gets kind of brought to the lowest common denominator. Like the yep. word, because we worked, the beginning of Treasury of Knowledge, we worked as a group. We worked in a whole bunch of groups. It was a whole big scene about five groups for every table at Vero Kensi's monastery in Bodh Gaya and Kalarimche kind of over, overlording it and um, uh, in Kempot Sultrim and Chato Rinpoche, you know, but they, they wouldn't sit down and have you let you read it all. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, we'd hash out a word and on and on, like between four or five people until we got to one that, well, nobody really minded. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that anyone really liked it. It was that nobody minded it. And if we could all agree not to mind a word, then we'd <laughs> use it. And it does lead to pretty boring, I mean, translation yep. is pretty boring anyway, but, <laughs> you know, tedious. It makes you old and looking at skulls. But <laughs> the... You know, and I, I'm not a big proponent of like wild, creative translations, but um, there is a style. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very careful to always translate something first before I look if, if anyone else translated it. And then, of course, if I see something wrong or I like that word better or something like that, I will, of course, t if I trust the translation, you know, mm -hmm. borrow it. But um, otherwise, I, I lose my style altogether, and I feel like it doesn't have the same tone throughout. 
a thing, which can make for, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of our so-called style is the fact that we've done this for with some of the same people for decades. Yeah. That helps. Yeah. And that we inherited, like a lot of the style, I mean, we're all practitioners. Uh, we're not scholars or academics or people who kind of look at Buddhism from a distance. We, we are interested in this, so we practice it. And uh, I mean, I've practiced a tiny bit in Tibetan, but not much. Uh, because I really wouldn't understand what I'm doing. I don't know Tibetan well enough for it to be fluent in my understanding. So I know, I've internalized our translations, even if some other people, not myself, were involved in the particular text. So that helps in creating a group style, because we've said the same thing you know, many times. But it is true what you say, that there is, I wouldn't call it I don't think we've ever done what you just described of like finding the word that was, you know, everybody could say, okay. It's never that. <laughs> right. I, I've never experienced that. Wow. Uh, it's always, you know, this one would be bad. People argue about which one they like, mm -hmm. but they, like, they each like this one or this one. And we almost always choose one of those. We don't go to something else just so that Joe didn't get it as opposed to David. You know, so we usually will choose one of those. But who's the we that chooses? The it's usually the group. It is okay. not usually an overlord. So you still have to hash out yep. which one of those ones that Joe and Fred or something all yep. like. Yeah, and there are, you know, there are normal human kind of political dynamics, power dynamics, where, well, if Joe got a couple, then maybe David will get a couple. And, you know, <laughs> those things happen. And sometimes you think, no, wait a second, that's totally screwed up. You know, this is Dharma. This is not about Joe and David, and who's, who's really, you know, gets their yayas with this and that. Or is it? <laughs> but, it, well, we're aware of that, and yeah. that's why, ultimately, something else has to cook. Um, but the one thing that I have noticed is that there is sometimes where one person might have a, a turn of phrase, or, uh, not an understanding, but a, like a f turn of phrase that is like really brilliant mm -hmm. or really cool, and the group may ruin it. That mm -hmm. does happen. Mm -hmm. That, in fact, I think is the, the one main mm -hmm. negative about group, mm -hmm. that, you know, any individual might, you know, really sail on mm -hmm. something really well mm -hmm. and that the group is like, oh no, th I mean really, you know, that's way too far out. And, and yet, it's pretty cool. So mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest negative, uh, the, that mm -hmm. we kind of don't allow this kind of brilliance. But sometimes, and this happened with Trungpa Rinpoche quite a bit, he would say something, it was like, how on earth do you understand that? How do you know that that's what it means? But he did, and it sounded good, and that was that. So mm -hmm. there's one other little thing that I thought was interesting. During, uh, you know, Kembo Tsutram, uh, Gyamso Rinpoche, came to our Sangha, the Vajradhatu Shambhala Sangha, and taught a series of programs over many, many years. And the first one, in 1991, at Shambhala Mountain Center, RMDC as it was then, he asked one of us, Scott Wellenbach, uh, one of the longest serving members of our group, to teach his translators how to work as a group. You were probably there. Uh, and s now Scott, I have to say, I do not know anyone who is more kind of egalitarian in his approach, mm -hmm. fundamentally. He was, he's Jewish, but he was really raised a Quaker. And he really, <laughs> he really is about as fair as can be. And it was only after one session of meeting with about 10 or 12 people, it was a lot of you know, there were a lot of people there. Only two or three of them were serving as Kempo's oral interpreter. There were a lot of other of his students that were good translators. Some of them never did oral interpretation, but they were all there. And after one session that I, I wasn't there, I, I'm told it was a two or three hour meeting, mm 
Scott went back to the Kempo and said, I'm really sorry, but this is not going to be possible. <laughs> there is no way that this group of people could possibly do what we do. And I would contend it's mainly because no, two things. Number one, they all knew too much. They didn't grow up knowing very little. Yeah. They already knew too much. And every translator has really strong opinions. I don't know anyone who doesn't. So that's the one thing. And number two, they didn't have a bilingual overlord. Yeah. And without that, Campbell Zoltram really did not know any English. I mean, yeah. a tiny bit, but not enough to say, this is how it is. Yeah. And without that, it's a food fight. Yeah, that's true. Trongri Rinpoche, uh, his students often asked him, you know, we'd like to do the practices in English. When can we just do them using translations? And he said, well, when all the translators agree. <laughs> 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 and I mean, he really felt it that that's a possibility because his learning about the Tibetan uh, translators. That. Yep. So we should address number okay. three and then open it up for questions. So what is number Larry? three? Okay, okay. Um, oh, restricted? Well, or in-house translate. Well, you've talked about, you're almost there. Yeah, I mean, there isn't too much more to say about this. Um, as many of you know, the Nalanda Translation Committee is primarily focused on translating for its own community, practices that they're doing or commentaries to support those practices. Yes, we've done a couple books that are really public. Marpa. Yeah, Life of Marpa, Reign of Wisdom. It's okay. embarrassingly long ago. I mean, it's, you know, 30-some years ago. Right. Uh, we haven't had time to do much of that because the community's needs in the way of you know what is required from the Tibetan literature have been immense. You know, a three-year retreat program took a while. That was a six-year project to translate uh, enough of those texts, and some of them were already done. Um, and we revised them at least three times, uh, you know, as people used them and pointed out, what does this mean? And, you know, mm. we revised things. So we really translate for a very in-house group and I dare say a fairly sophisticated group in terms of their knowledge of Dharma. The, you know, they may not be scholars, but they are practitioners and they have studied the Dharma and they're, you know, they're tough. They, they want to know what does it really mean. Uh, and we don't even consider that these books are going to be published by Shambhala Publications because they're not supposed to be. Now that's another big topic. Big thing, yeah. Big interesting topic. So for us, it's kind of limited, and as a result, we have the, we've, we've uh, you could say we brainwashed the community into our lingo, because it's what they grew up on, and they're used to it. It has, a, we use an enormous number of Sanskrit terms, which is Trungpa Rinpoche's choice. Really, he liked that. He considered it the lingua franca for Mahayana Buddhism. He never liked using a Tibetan term unless there wasn't a Sanskrit term. He wanted to put things in English if it worked, but only if it really was going to be accepted. A good, good example is bodhicitta. And by the way, the word is not bodhicitta. That's an animal. That's an enlightened cat. <laughs> bodhicitta it could be translated in many different ways. You know, heart or mind of awakening, enlightenment, uh, you know, I, a lot of different decent translations, but we could not settle on one that we thought everybody would say, yeah, that's a good one. So we stuck with the Sanskrit. And Rinpoche's hope was that many of those words would become English. They would enter the English dictionaries, just like Buddha and Dharma and Sangha are in the dictionary. You know, I don't know how many Sanskrit words are in the OED or whatever else, but he wanted more of them. Do you know? A lot, a lot more than yeah, I, I'm sure but, you're right. But if texts are restricted, it, they're not going to find their way into dictionary. Yeah. Yeah. You think? We use the uh -huh. Merriam-Webster, and, and uh -huh. I, uh, you know, I, I kind of know all the ones that are in there uh, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> um, because then I don't have to use diacritics on them. <laughs> yeah. That's but, convenient. Uh, 
Yeah. So anyway, so we do a very in-house thing, um, but we try for it to be, you know, very intelligible English that's not overly difficult to understand. Uh, so it's not that esoteric. The, the, the Dharma may be esoteric, but the language we hope is not. Yeah, well, if there was ever some issue for me about restriction and not restriction, uh, it's been kind of blown apart um, again by <laughs> our group, the Sadr group, because everything's um, published. And uh, whereas I think um, there was a purpose for it once, uh, I think w things are out there no matter what, and so then you might as well just go with it. I mean, I don't feel like there's any choice, actually, mm. anymore. You can restrict a book, and it'll still get out there, and, the, and even if you restrict it, there's something even more outrageous already out there that isn't restricted, and um, just the way secrets are, I feel like, you know, I feel like I'm the Snowden of translators or something, but <laughs> <laughs> if something is a secret, it's going to get weird. It's going to get misrepeated. It's mm. going to get told the wrong way. People are going to think the wrong thing. And But if it's just, you know, if you can make a clear explication, then, then it'll be a good understanding. And we have an yeah. incredibly well-educated readership in English in this country yeah. and in almost all modern countries now. Yeah. Nothing like it was in Tibet. That's right. So, uh, you know, what to do, la, as they say in <laughs> Bhutan. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it's out there. It's, it's yeah. I don't think, there's all that much purpose anymore in, in restriction, actually. Yeah. And I mean, what could be more boring than reading a long liturgy? Like, people aren't going to do it. Yeah. So you don't need to restrict it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? I, yeah. mean, I just like, who's going to read that? Yeah. You know, that's, that's my yeah. You know, yeah. opinion. I mean, I've felt a little iffy on a few things uh, that are in a couple of my books. Uh, and no one's ever said anything, and it's, I'm pretty sure it's because they haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. That's right. So, should we? Yeah. Yeah, any questions? Or I think, comments? I think Whatever. that Ivan has like a microphone uh, yeah. or something back there. Mm. Oh, it's so cool. Questions, comments? Uh, Y'all were just talking about the res you know restricted and all this kind of thing. Could you say something about the idea of um, things being self-secret? You know, like yeah, you can publish this in English, but like, you know, like you said, kind of, you're gonna sit down with this thing and somebody's gonna read it, and like after three days, they're gonna be like, mm, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, the only harm I've ever, and this was many years ago now, and I haven't heard of anything for like 30 years or something. A, a, a few. One or maybe two people I heard of who read like Tibetan Yoga and Secret Doctrines, mm. and way back, you know, and and then tried to do weird yoga breathing <laughs> stuff mm -hmm. and kind of went crazy. So that only that stuff can be if someone tries to do that based on a book, of or based on a bad translation, especially uh, that could be harmful. There's nothing else, I think, that's, that could be harmful. Um, and there is, in the so-called higher teachings, the f you know, what do they call this now? The um, uh, non-dual teachings, which is hilarious. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, self-secret. I mean, that's one thing. I, I was thinking of this recently. You know, there's this great <coughs> kind of onus on the translator to have that realization of what they're translating. True, that would be good. Also the reader, though. Mm. The reader needs to mm -hmm. have that realization and put it into practice. Otherwise, the words don't even matter, you know? So there's just as much of a responsibility. Yeah. And if they don't understand it, it's self-secret, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. The one thing I'd add, I, I agree with you completely, uh, is that, and I've seen this also happen quite a lot, uh, when you keep something kind of restricted, it becomes special. And you may not believe this, but the special, the anticipation of something being special 
is way more than 50 or 60 percent of what catalyzes the experience that is special. So, you know, some amount, I mean, you could say this is just daydreaming projections, and it probably is, but it works. And so keeping things, you know, quote unquote secret, restricted, until the student has done, you know, whether it's their Nundro, and then they receive an Abhisheka, and what, you know, there is some little bit of so-called magic that happens by not knowing about it. And that, like for us, you know, the translators, we're the one greatest violator of that because for most of us, we were right, you know, having to prepare all these things before we were ready to practice them. And of course, you know, our teacher was doing this with us. It was completely kosher from that point of view. He felt, you know, no problem. But it changed our experience of it. And, you know, too bad for us. You know, we didn't have that kind of anticipation. We had a different way of getting that because I think we did still have some way of, you know, kind of having some magic happen, but it was different for us. Uh, but I really do think that's helpful and not, it's, there's a respect about it. It has nothing to do with, oh, you can't have this because it's somehow special, you're not worthy. But, you know, as a student on a path, if you think there is such a thing as a path, that has graded whatever, which I know some people may disagree with, well, then maybe there's a certain staging of what you are exposed to. Well, that can I, be helpful. I have a, I have a counter Good. to that, um, and I understand that, but I think by the same token, uh, if you think you, that thing can become a possession, and you know, if it's held away from you, and then you get it, then you've got it and then so on, your other don't yeah. have it. Yes. And so then you think you've got something just because it's been kept away and restricted. Yep. And I think that happens very easily yep. uh, all over the place. You know, it's kind of like, yeah. um, you know, oh, these special, super high special teachings, I've got them. And then you aren't honest with yourself about, but did you really realize them? Because because it's enough to have got them. Similarly, like if you do 100,000 something or other, so it's like, I did 100,000, but, but did you really yeah. get it? And yeah. I mean, I, that's the problem with counting yes. things. Oh, so counting, another whole topic, yeah. <laughs> but, big um, topic. I think there's a, you, you know, things that you feel like you can possess that are special, there's a problem there. Yeah. Just like thinking of yourself as special. Yes, I completely agree. Yeah. So that is what also happens. <laughs> and and you got to deal with that. It's a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, just a quick comment um, and a question. Uh, so Judy Leaf commented that when she took the profound treasury of of oral instruction to um, Tibet and China and gave them as gifts, there's a process now of of folks up there translating that English back into Tibetan and Chinese mm -hmm. because they have so much admiration for um, for Chogim Trungpa's work. So what do you guys think of that? And that, that is just kind of a fascinating thought. Yeah. And as students of his, did, did he kind of hope for that someday? Or was that Definitely. part of his plan? I mean, in terms of Trungpa Rinpoche, oh, he very much hoped that, you know, his students or their students or, you know, somebody who descended from him would go back to Asia to teach people. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, he really, really hoped that would happen. Um, his books, even during his lifetime, were translated into many languages, and he liked that. And the question of them being able to be translated into Tibetan is a really interesting question. Zong Sir Kansai Rinpoche uh, and I had a discussion about that. He asked one of his Kenpos a few years ago to translate meditation in action into Tibetan, working with one of his uh, Eng native English-speaking students. Um, so the two of them worked on it. They, the, the English native also knew some Tibetan, but the Kenpo was the real person putting it into Tibetan. And uh, Dzongsu Kensu Rinpoche thought it was uh, pretty good, but then w a couple years later, I said, well, so how's it going? And he said, it's impossible. And you know, <laughs> this is one of the easier books. 
I, I would say. Yeah. He, said, he said, for instance, how would you say meditation in action? <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't speak Tibetan. I, I, I really had no idea. And he said he had no idea. Because he, he understood the English enough to know this is Lamkir. really hard to say. Hmm? Lamkir. Yeah, right. So, <laughs> does that represent the English? Yeah. Uh, now, here's a good See, one. See, there is no literal <laughs> translation. Exactly. No such thing. Definitely no such thing. Yeah. Ken McLeod, some of our good old friend, I talked yeah. with him just a few months ago. He's going nuts about lung care. Is he? Oh, yeah. Oh, he's, well, we weren't talking about that. He's asked every single person like he knows. Really? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, we, we, we hadn't talked in a long time, so it was a lot of fun to catch up. And I don't know how it happened, but somehow the topic of him encountering Trungpa Rinpoche came up. I knew they had met once or twice. Trungpa Rinpoche. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so apparently Ken asked Trungpa Rinpoche, how do you say cutting through spiritual materialism in Tibetan? And without any hesitation, he said, Chumin Chupa. What would, how, what would you normally say? If cutting, you were, cutting through, no, cutting non-dharma. Yeah, yeah, literally cutting anti-dharma or yeah. non-dharma. Now, does that convey the, the richness of the word, yeah. you know, spiritual materialism? I mean, but he said it. He's the author. He <laughs> coined that term. <laughs> and that's as good as he could do. Because, yeah. uh, you know, and I really think it really isn't very good. Well, because, I mean, he's... Was English was so good, he was thinking in English. That's so right. It wasn't a that's translation. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So Dzongsar Kinsar Rinpoche said to me, I really think translating into Tibetan is extremely difficult. He said, for example, my father's books, his Tinli Norba Rinpoche, he said, my father's books, no problem, because he wrote them with a Tibetan mind. Yeah. Even if they started in English, they're all Tibetan. They're easy to translate, no problem. But not Trungpa Rinpoche. He said, he didn't exactly say this. I think I used the words, but he really liked them. I, I said something like, he was completely rewired into English. Yeah. And just as you say, he thought in English. Yeah. He taught in English. He was not like, how do I say this in English? Oh, here it is. Didn't happen. But then Zongsar Kensar Rinpoche said, however, Chinese, no problem. Mm. Chinese is a modern language. Mm. They have all the problems we have. You know, maybe they have different problems too, and other things, but they have, it's a modern language. I don't think that'll be a problem, though he doesn't know Chinese. But Tibetan, he thought was gonna be very, very difficult. English is so much more versatile than Tibetan. It's something that you yeah. I have a question about um, rhythm, um, in the sense of, practicing in Tibetan, it's like so easy to make a meter. It's created, you can yeah. just chop a word in half or put it together and then you have a meter. Yeah. And not only that, there's melodies that go along with this. Yeah. And I've even heard some teach a teacher say that for one particular practice, the melody is more important mm. than the words. Mm -hmm. And this is, people practice this in Tibetan, this yeah. practice. And I'm just wondering, um, what you think about that issue, really, um, and the way that people practice aloud in English, as well as um, if e either of your teachers had anything specific to say about that now or in the future? Well, I mean, it's a great loss. That I, That's something that's really hard to make up for. And of course, there are some liturgies that people have tried to put into meters and things, and it's better, but it, and even have tunes to it. And of course, Kempel Sultram with all his singy-songy stuff. But um, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I do all my practice in Tibetan for that reason, actually. But I don't necessarily advocate other people to do that unless they understand it, because then it's a, it's a payoff, you know. Mm. Either you're going to understand what it says or you get to have the tune which is and the rhythm which is it's more than you know a blessing it's like um it's a you know it's an embodiment of 
song is such a you know huge thing in our in our whole being. So then it's like an embodiment of the ritual or whatever it is, more than just saying, I think the English words. Um, and of course, I try. You know, I was used to lead a Tara practice for like 15 years and did half and half to try and make everybody happy, mm. all the gods and the demons, I guess. <laughs> uh, but it doesn't. Not the same. So yeah, I. That's a bummer. That's uh, what I'm say. <laughs> I, I agree with all these problems and issues. Trungpa Rinpoche's approach was: uh, people have to practice in their native language, or they won't have a clue what they're doing. So he never, for a second, recommended practicing in a foreign language. Tibetan, for most of his students, was a foreign language. Yes, it had some kind of wonderful tradition. <laughs> Of course, but I would say he would say hogwash to practicing in Tibetan just mm. because it's in Tibetan. You know, I mean, the Jews think everything has to be in Hebrew. It's a very special language, unlike anything else. Well, the Buddha himself made it clear no language is like that. You know, it's Sanskrit, sams Samskrita, perfectly constructed. Yeah, that's the whole trip with Sanskrit. But the Buddha didn't teach in Sanskrit. Yeah. We know that. You know. So he taught in the vernacular. What language did he teach in? We have no idea. But he probably taught in lots of different languages because he walked all over the place. And there were lots of different languages in India, like there still are. So we could... Trungpa Rinpoche wanted us to set to music two passages in the Vajrayogini Sadhana. So we gave it to Ives. Ives took it in the bathtub and figured it out in one night. <laughs> and it was great. And we had to then massage it. We had to really work with it for a, a good several days to then make sure we didn't sacrifice any meaning. We had to add a line, I think one line, because it just didn't work. Because, uh, you know, English is like twice as many words as Tibetan, usually, mm -hmm. sometimes more. But, I mean, Ives is amazing at this. Um, and it worked out pretty well. And then I said to Rinpoche, both then and years later, would you like more of that? I mean, Ives can do it. Uh, then, you know, the working with it takes a lot more time. But he said, nope, that's enough. Uh -huh. That was enough. Because I think it, it gave people a little taste of something that was more melodic and rhythmic and all the rest of it. So my real answer to your question is, this will never work in translations. And the point of the translations, I believe, should be to accurately teach people what the Dharma means and that the meaning is way more important than some evocative feeling, which hopefully comes along in another way than the rhythm of the language or the musicality. Or If you can do both, great. But the real thing is we want them to know what they're doing so that they actually attain some realization. And hopefully some of those people will be good poets and musicians <laughs> and they will write their own liturgies in English and Polish and you know Serbo-Croatian or whatever um, because that's what the Tibetans did. There is hardly a liturgy that Tibetans chant that comes from Sanskrit. Yeah, there are a few. But I would say 90-some percent of them are indigenous Tibetan compositions, not translations. Mm -hmm. So this is, I think our job is just like for a little bit of time to grow some siddhas and then turn them loose on the language and let them <laughs> write beautiful English that is wonderful verse. Now Ginsburg and I had lots of fun talks about this but I could never get him to finish his Gundro. I, I dearly, I kept praying for him to finish Gundro so that we could give him the Vajrayogini Sadhana. God knows what he would have done with it, but it would have been fun. So that's, that's really how I feel about this. I never talked to Trung Rinpoche about that. I don't know what he would have said. Clerk? As a prelude to my question, I just want to mention that one night when Trungpa Rinpoche was meeting with Dingo Kensa Rinpoche, uh, Ginsburg and I had a conversation about uh, how the Tibetan style of singing could enter into poetry. And what we came up 
with as the closest example was the the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. Hmm. Once oh. upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and wearily over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, suddenly there came a tap. So on. Yep. yep. So we were sitting there and doing that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Ngawang, your friend, our friend Ngawang Zangpo. I don't remember which book, but one of his books, one of his translations, he has a kind of little essay on this problem of English translations not being melodic and you know, have a beautiful cadence to them. And he quotes a number of, I don't know if they're 19th century or early 20th century, but maybe even longer ago, people who were translating, I think from Sanskrit, beautiful English that was like, it rhymed and it, it was like beautiful and like nobody does that. Hardly anybody. But I have to say, I happened to see Ives last night, so that's why he's on my mind. And he told me that the Chuying Zhu, the uh, treasury of Dharma, Dharma Datu, that he did many, many years ago, is in d uh, dactyl hexameter. Mm -hmm. I, I, I said, well, you know, I never read it very thoroughly. <laughs> I definitely didn't notice that. Can you demonstrate how that sounds. He then, from memory, recited the first page of the Iliad, I think in Greek, yeah. that was in dactyl hexameter. Yeah. It was really cool to listen to. <laughs> uh, and then he, 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 I think he didn't remember the Chuying Tzu, but he remembered a different text he had done in the same meter. I don't know that I Shinta know Chenpo enough. Is what you said. Yeah, maybe Shinta Chenpo, yeah. I think, at any rate. And he remembered enough of it to do it, and it's like, I mean, it's like another realm of language that is way beyond my, and I said, how, do you, how did you learn how to do that? And he said, classics, you have to be a classics mm -hmm. major, Greek and Latin. Mm -hmm. Sanskrit is, has all the same, it's got its own verse forms, but it's just like the Greek and Latin, it's just its own different things. He said, that's the only way. You have to really, really learn Greek and Latin well. Because that's where English comes from. So, but something to aspire to. You can <laughs> still make beautiful English. Yes, you really can. It just can. might not be in meter. Or so, my question is, uh, <laughs> 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 uh, it has to do with, uh, uh, you've demonstrated that you can't nail down a lexicon, even though the Tibetans tried to with the Mahavirapati. But nonetheless, there was at least a, a, a bead on certain words, like you could take kunshi or something. And uh, you had a garland of different possibilities for a, a common word. So you take something like kunshi or alaya, and it, uh, obviously from different uh, approaches, it means something very different. Yeah. But at least it has kind of a, a basic uh, meaning that ground. you can then adapt on. <laughs> yeah, a basic ground. <laughs> an all ground <laughs> and and the, the, it almost seems like the western way of translating is making that impossible because it's the opposite of the Tibetan attempt to nail down a lexicon in the sense that because of the academic imperative or whatever you have uh, so many people feel the necessity to come up with a yeah. different word and of course the, you know with with Gunther he didn't even include a lexicon in the <laughs> book so it was absolutely <laughs> impossible yeah. at least people include lexicons but it takes so much work to figure out what somebody is translating how it relates to what else is being translated in another system or by a different translator so do you think it's hopeless or do you <laughs> think there's any chance that we can develop some kind of consistency enough that we can follow these terms uh, yeah. Th from text to text and from meaning to meaning. Well, yeah. I kind of do. Um, every they translator, every translator I've s spoken to seems to just like get the fear of God in them if you say anything like let's standardize. I mean, it was just kind of like freaking out. And it is an unfortunate thing about academic translations. They do feel like obliged to come out with a new clever, you know, saying for words. On the other hand, it sounds like, Clark, you're still trying to always relate back to what the Tibetan is. You know, so you're, you know, you want a transparent translation mm -hmm. so that you can know what it's said in Tibetan, but then why not read the Tibetan? You know, that, um, so um, sometimes I've thought, and sometimes when I was, used to do oral translation, I would on purpose use different 
words so that people would get a fuller depth of meaning for a term from all different angles instead of just sticking with a you know replacement terms um, sometimes that can be good you know what does it really mean could oh maybe that's an interesting way to think of it or you know kind of get around it but I mean I understand the frustration and I do I totally do that like what the hell is the Tibetan you know and I'm trying to look it up and why didn't they footnote it what are they translating but that's just because we know the language already and for people who don't have a clue who just want to read something and understand it I think it's okay to have different th certainly the words are used differently in different contexts and I, I don't I stopped trying to make the exact same word in English translate the exact same word in Tibetan every time I use several you know I'll have a, maybe four or five ways I'll translate one word because it's so boring otherwise <laughs> Well, we, we translations do a, are boring and we are more <laughs> boring in that we do try to be internally consistent at least within one text and although you know Gunther is very inventive was very inventive he was he seemed to be immensely consistent but he really yeah. wasn't it, it was all over the place I mean one of the books that Shambhala published that I'm embarrassed to say I was the editor of Matrix of Mystery, mm. uh, the only thing I felt I was successful at was getting him to put in the Tibetan in parentheses after configurational complexity. Uh, <laughs> well, that's Kilkor, Mandala. Uh, and I used to bring the manuscript to our translation meetings. Whenever things got kind of stuck or boring or whatever, I'd take out another you know what he does for this? Yeah. And everybody break into hysterics because it was really bizarre uh, he wouldn't allow me to say mandala he only would allow me to say Kilkor I mean we argued about it a lot he was by the way he was a wonderful man really yeah. really sweet yeah. um, but you know Sherab Chudzin uh, a friend of many of ours was the only editor I know who really edited him and Gunther loved it mm. Dawn of Tantra is I believe the only book of Gunther's, it's half Rinpoche, half Gunther, where it, the, it's English. Uh, Gunther is really readable, and that's because of Sherub. And, and Gunther liked what he did. Uh, I mean, Matrix of Mystery was a monster to be able to do anything like that with, and, and I don't know that I would have been able to. Um, so we tend to want to be consistent. Uh, and, we are, but, and we argue about it, but we also change our minds. And from one thing to the next, it's not always consistent. So, yeah, I mean, and of course, with technical terms, it needs to be consistent. I don't think yeah. anyone. You yeah, know. you know, one of the things one of the, I wanted to say earlier, one of the justifications for us using Sanskrit terms and other maybe peculiar things, the the way we get away with doing that is we said to ourselves, well, if we're going to do that, we have to have a glossary in the book, so that you can look and see. Here's what bodhicitta, some little thing about it, so that it's not just what you know, some foreign word to a new reader. So glossaries can be very helpful, and they're very different than the footnotes. And you need footnotes too for certain reasons, but glossaries actually can be uh, fascinating to see. And there are many translators that do that. Uh, I think that's a very helpful way of yeah. standardizing things. Thank you both very much. Um, I really appreciated hearing what you had to say tonight. Um, my question is for you. I work in a translation committee of two with one overlord and one Kempel. So two <laughs> English speakers and one overlord and one Kempel. And <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and the other member is Richard Barron. <laughs> mm -hmm. Anyways, the Kempo is young and very masterful in Tibetan. He's from Bhutan, but he's very masterful in Tibetan but sort of insists that you can't say this in English this way because it doesn't mean that in English. And this infuriates particularly Chucky to no end because he, he complains that Kempo doesn't know nuance. Mm. Mm. And so I'm just curious what you have to say about, I was very interested in your process of taping everything and going through the tapes and it's wonderful, but do you have anything to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> 
without the specifics, it's hard to know. Um, I, th you know, I mean, the real issue is how good is his English? And if it isn't really good, then I think the native English person, people, both of you, have to overrule what is said because you do have a, a, a different intimacy with the, your native language. I can language. think of one example. Okay. <laughs> it's really stupid, but Pakce, um, you know, the um, league or Yojana. Oh, yeah. I said something like the far reaches, like I just wanted it to be accessible. Uh -huh. And he said, no, this is a specific measurement of distance. Yep. And I was frustrated. We, we said Yojana because we, <laughs> we didn't know what else. And, and you know, we, we, we're a cop out. I do know that. We cop out to the Sanskrit and then we, f and then we either footnote or put it in the glossary. And you know, it's so many fathoms or I don't know how big a Yojana is, but it is a real measure. Right. Uh, if it's some technical thing, you can get away a, with it. It was in a sadhana, it was in like one line, and I just felt like saying, you know, yep. so many leagues was just odd and kind of took me out of the flow. Yeah. Like here's, here's a different example. Uh, often, you know, they use really big Tibetan numbers, but they're very specific. Like it says <laughs> yeah. 10 million or, you know, 100 million times 100. <laughs> You know, I mean, they have, and they have words for these, yeah. you know, so it doesn't, it doesn't sound in Tibetan so weird, you know, saya, chewa, drungjur, you know, are the powers of 10, you know, so some, the, I remember we once said millions, billions, and trillions, <laughs> when the numbers weren't exactly those numbers, and often it's just like, it means a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really mean, <laughs> really, oh, there's a really hundred million. Lot. Somebody <laughs> counted a hundred million, and that's what it is. You know, it's really just a lot. So that's an example where we did take liberty with it because it was just too ponderous. I think the English people have to decide this. Uh, and it's a, you know, f you should fight about it. You know, it's good to fight about this uh, because he'll learn more English. And oh. that's really important. Because then he'll be better. He'll be a better resource for you. Yeah. It's very difficult, though. Thank you. Um, uh, I have a question about translating from English to Chinese. And also, by the way, it's totally OK to translate Dharma into modern Chinese. And modern Chinese is a growing language. But the problem I also always have is that because there's a such huge cultural resources and also cultural baggage in terms of ancient Chinese Buddhist language, and also yeah. considering what you mentioned about how the reader will approach the information. Um, so there's a hesitation about whether to use a more uh, generally accepted Buddhist language or to use a modern term to describe it. And uh, at the same time, language is uh, both an accumulation and a growing thing. So I assume that probably after a while, after all your wonderful work, in English there will also be accumulated a, mm. some certain mm. amount of so-called Dharmic language. Mm -hmm. And then you will probably also have this problem. So I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> I only have to wait a couple thousand years. Well, yeah. we'll see. <laughs> But uh, would you like to uh, just provide some insight on that? Thank you. You want to say anything? Oh, um, I think it's the same. Yeah, you. I understand you have the old language uh, already there. Actually, in English, w we have the similar problem, but not with Buddhist terminology, but with terminologies of different kinds of sciences, let's say. Uh, currently, a lot of people will put sort of psychological language from our culture into a translation. Previously, they would put, say, Christian language in. And uh, it's very hard not to do that. Um, most of translations always become obsolete very quickly. I mean, I would say everything has to be retranslated every 50 years. You know, Herbert Gunther <laughs> said every 20 years for uh -huh. English. And he said that. Yeah. Which is kind of yeah. bizarre, but interesting. But I mean, the biggest problem every translator has, and I think it's this, is who is your, who are you writing for? Mm. Who's your audience? And if it's scholarly, uh, 
or you know Buddhists who are familiar with the old Buddhist language of Chinese, then then you use that. But if you really want to reach like you know a more modern young one, then um, you can use a modern version, except that knowing that that will become obsolete quicker, mm -hmm. because modern language changes so quickly, uh, and sometimes it can make it sound a little bit superficial. You have to be mm -hmm. careful. Uh, in, in fact, I, <laughs> my favorite language, is, I'm going to do a whole paper on this, but my favorite language for Dharma would be totally 60s language, American 60s language. And I have a reason for that, not just because I liked it, uh, because the whole movement here, that whole subculture was focused on the spiritual and actually on spiritual experience and actually developed a language that worked. Now it sounds silly. We can't use it because it sounds so dated and silly, and yet it was the perfect language. And now our culture is really not interested in spiritual, and so we don't have a very good language for our dharma anymore right now in terms of idiomatic translation. And, and here's, a, here's a perfect example of that. I never knew you felt that way, but you know the word guru in addition to being a teacher, but when you talk about uh, met meter in Sanskrit, the syllables, we say long and short in English, but in Sanskrit they say guru and lagu. And those literally mean, guru means heavy and lagu means light. So it's a very 60s term. Heavy. <laughs> He's so heavy. That's He's perfect. my brother. <laughs> Can you get, oh good. And you know, the definition of guru comes from that. Someone who is heavy with good qualities is the literal <laughs> definition of why, you know. But what did the Tibetans do? They didn't go anywhere near that. They were completely not literal. They said lama. Mother, su mother superior. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering how the issues you've discussed, uh, and this may have a lot to do with the first one, literal and so on, how treasure texts might differ in terms of uh. the issues that they present. Yeah. We, uh, yeah. We, we, we work with a lot of them, um, and mo I would say mostly we don't do anything different. It's mostly just more Tibetan that we put into English. The, o the main exception to that is the Sanskrit. And, th and you know, this is, a, I find this very frustrating because I kind of think it's ridiculous. But, um, you know, it's common that Tibetan texts preserve a very corrupt form of Sanskrit mm -hmm. because the, there's a big distance between the old people, the translators in the Tibetan tradition who knew the language and then later authors or discoverers of terma or whatever. So it gets corrupted, and it pretty significantly so. Uh, but Trungpa Rinpoche, most of the time, preferred that we just leave it the way it is because it's terma. Mm -hmm. So we do. And mm -hmm. we, s we might footnote it so that a person understands why we've done that, but, but there is something special about the terma. About the mistakes in terma. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I, I don't have a good logic for this, but we often do that. With Karma Senge Rinpoche, he's similar in wanting it to be the same, not, you know, but he said, like, if it really is something that is so clearly wrong and commonly done properly elsewhere, then he often allows us to change it. But a good exception to that is the word dakini, mm -hmm. because they often say dh for the first syllable mm -hmm. in terma. It's very common, I've seen. A lot of dh instead of d. And he didn't want us to change that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he's the overlord. We just say, <laughs> okay, whatever you want. But most of the terma, we just treat as, it's just Tibetan. See, I think of treasure texts as by their nature not just like a like a didactic text but they're supposed to carry a certain amount of power and aren't they sometimes in um, I don't know if vernacular is the right term but not necessarily just a rehash of classical language 
Uh, I, I, I've only, I did one book of Terma uh, Himalingpa, and I, for me, the language was, even though it was attributed to Guru Rinpoche, the language is very much 14th century, the, you know, the time of the Tertan himself. Uh, so I didn't treat it in really much differently than, yeah, than the same thing. I hate to, 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 you know, kind of uh, explode some of these myths, but, you know, most terma does not come out whole in the form that we see it. Yeah. Unless it's mind terma, which means it's not physical, it's right. in the tertun's mind that this, and then it's either dictated or written down, and, uh, you know, that person is doing it, and I can't help but kind of think, well, it's in that person's mm -hmm. world, as opposed mm -hmm. to maybe Padmasambhava's mm -hmm. ancient yeah, whatever. Right. And even when it's sater, earth terma, like most of Trungpa Rinpoche's termas in Tibet were sater, they were earth termas. Well, they weren't the whole text that he got out of a rock. Mm -hmm. It was usually a scroll that had a few syllables on it that mm -hmm. nobody can read except the tertun because it's, uh, it's gibberish. It's not like, you know, yeah. a, a script that anybody reads. It's yeah. weird writing. And if you're the tertun at the right place and the time and the right people around you and particular dharma, when those five things are all together and then they decode it. Yeah, and which is called comes, translation. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So it's kind exactly. of an aw it's kind of an awesome responsibility to be the next person in that particular process. Yeah, I think. Well, well it, the whole thing is awesome and horrible. Any <laughs> 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 special translator hell. So, are there any other final comments? I think we're coming to the end of the evening. Do you want to? Sum up anything or <laughs> I think lay you just to did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot to add up. Mm. Uh. All right, well it's thank really you. It's really hard. I just do want to say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we really hope you've got a lot of people here who are translators and aspiring to be. Thank you. We need your help. Yeah. So yeah. I'm really glad you're doing this. You know, my teacher never uh, counseled his students to become translators generally, maybe a particular person he might, but you know, and I feel that way too. I think you have to have either a knack for it or a real interest in it. This is not something you should feel like you must do because you're a Dharma person, but I'll tell you, it's one of the best ways to study Dharma. Well, that's for sure. So good. Yeah. So, and even if you never become a translator, it's interesting, and you're going to learn a lot. So, and then you might find out you have a, an aptitude for it. Mm -hmm. So that much I would recommend. So thank you all for coming thank and you. working on it. <laughs>